Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. All right. How many people is your first time at MCC East Bay? It's your first time here. MashaAllah, welcome. Alhamdulillah. All right, so this is a joint effort between three masjids, three masajid. Which ones? And Walnut Creek. Walnut Creek. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to try to have events. This is the first, hopefully, of many events for this age group. And our goal is to make events that are practical, where you can actually learn a skill. So like today, we're going to learn about cars. We're going to do some jujitsu. We're going to learn and meet Brother Adisa. And if you're interested in jujitsu, you're going to have an opportunity to sign up to do regular classes with him. He's in Santa Clara, but we're going to try to have him come to the East Bay, inshallah. And then we're really, really excited. We have two of our local Imams from San Ramon and Walnut Creek. Imam Hassan and Imam Bilal. And if you don't know them, you're going to get to know them today, inshallah. And trust me, when I was your age, I, I mean, we, we didn't have this kind of, we didn't have an Imam. Imam look at these guys. Look how fresh they look. Mashallah. We didn't have Imams like this that were young, that were born here, that could relate to us. It was very difficult. Now, they have their time. These guys have serious knowledge, okay? Not just style. They got knowledge, okay? And you have the opportunity to sit and learn from them, okay? And benefit from them. So I would take, take it seriously, inshallah. So after today, we're going to follow up and see what, how, what kind of opportunities we have to learn regularly. Because our goal is to be strong Muslim men, right? So we're going to be strong believers, but we're also going to be strong physically, inshallah. So that's what we're trying to do. And also mentally, and have real life skills, right? So that we can go out and uh, take on the world, inshallah. Okay? Alhamdulillah. So, without further ado, inshallah, I'm going to have Imam Bilal come up and address what is Futuwa? Why do we name this thing Futuwa? Right? Inshallah, the beginning of the day. Bismillah. Imam Bilal. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa ahdahu salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'da na'udha billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتذر وما بدلوا تبديلا I want everyone to pay close attention to this because I'm going to ask you guys questions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says From the believers there are men who kept the promise that they made to Allah There are other people who are waiting for their opportunity and there are those who have already fulfilled that promise and they never ever Broke the promise they made with Allah. Okay. The very beginning we said, From the believing people there are men. Which means what? That a person can be a believer and be a male, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are a? A man. Allah SWT specifically uses the word rijal, men. Okay. In Arabic, you have words that will share root letters. Common letters. And words that share root letters, have common letters, oftentimes have commonalities in their meanings as well. So we're talking about root words, root letters. So the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses is rijalun. Rijal means men. There are three root letters here. Ra, jim, and lam. These three same root letters are used in another very, very common word, rijal. What does rijal mean? Yes. Leg. Exactly. What is a leg supposed to do? First and foremost, yeah, go ahead. Support. Okay, what else? You. Come on, someone else raised their hand. What else? It supports. What else does it do? It kicks. What else? Abs absolutely. What else? Yeah, walking. So look, a leg is supposed to be something that you stand on. A man is supposed to be someone that you can rely on support. He can support other people. Right? Talk about walking. What do they say? Put your what forward? Your best foot forward. Your leg is supposed to help you lead. Leg also does what? You said kick. It also has the ability to... Be aggressive to also be defensive. All of these are qualities that a man needs to exhibit. Each and every one of us. But the wisdom is in choosing which quality to exhibit and when. Okay, which quality do you show at what time? Now, some of these concepts, you know, they're just concepts. They're just ideas. Talk about support and defense and aggression, all that stuff. The best way to learn is to look at an example of an individual. And the best example is whom? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is for all of you, all of you, the best example. So I want to look at just one hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was narrated to us by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. Anas ibn Malik, when he narrated this hadith, he was what your age is right now. What your age is. 
So he stayed with the Prophet ﷺ between the ages of 9 to like 19, which is pretty much all of you are in this age range. And he saw the Prophet ﷺ at that time, and he saw what it means to be a man. How does he describe the Prophet ﷺ? Do you know what he says? He says the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was كَانَ أَحْسَنَ nas. He was the best of all people. Now this is a very general statement, right? To say he's the best is just like, what's so specific about it? Just Oh, he's just the best. Then he tells us specifically some of the qualities that make him the best. Some salient features of the Prophet ﷺ. He says that كَانَ أَجْوَدَ nas. The Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of all people. Most generous of all people. You guys heard this phrase, uh, get rich or die trying. You guys heard this phrase before? Right? What do you think? This is something to live by or something? To not live by. We should live by this or no? no? I see some people like nodding their heads, man. No, this is not something you live by. You know why? This job that people are out there breaking their backs for, breaking their necks for, the day that that guy dies, that same company is going to have an ad for that position. They're going to forget about you the day you die, my friend. You don't go and forsake your life for these things. Right? A job is just there to help you support those who are in need. That's it. The Prophet وسلم, he was there as the greatest support for the people around him. Men are those who support the women folk around them. The Prophet وسلم, supported the orphans and the widows. He took care of the people who are less fortunate in his community. From that, that's how we learn generosity. Let me tell you a story of the Prophet وسلم's generosity. Once a man comes in to the masjid, the Prophet وسلم, he was gifted, someone had gifted him like a very nice cloak. It came from all the way from Yemen. That's a pretty big deal back in those days. And the Prophet ﷺ looked better than anyone else looked we wearing any other clothes. Like, I know you guys try to, like, uh, at least you should, at least, dress nice when you go anywhere. This is another quality of a human, of a man, not just the, of a human, of a man. As someone who, you, you know where they say, look the part, you dress for the job that you want? Right? Don't walk around in pajamas, man. You gotta look like someone who stands out. That's what the Prophet did to Allah ﷺ. He always looked fresh. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa had a cloak someone had gifted him. And he looked amazing in it, and everyone complimented him, and he loved that cloak. Once a person comes in, he sees the Prophet ﷺ wearing it. He has seen it before. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi doesn't have it on one day. He goes and he asks a question in front of everyone. Like, you guys are here? So he comes in. The Prophet is sitting here. And he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, can you give me that cloak? He just straight up asked him to his face. Like, this super expensive thing that he got from another country. Can you give that to me? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gets up, goes straight to his house, grabs that cloak, comes back, hands it over to him with a smile on his face. Doesn't say one word. And the guys who are sitting there, they're all staring at that dude like daggers in their eyes. What is wrong with you, man? First of all, the Prophet looks amazing in that. Second of all, like, do you think that it's just easy to give away something you really like? And the Prophet also is not going to say no. They know that he's the most generous person. So they get really upset with him. And they're just staring at it, but they can't say anything because the Prophet is there. So you can't yell at somebody in the company of the Prophet. So they wait for the gathering to finish. And when class is done, and the Prophet also leaves, then they all gang up on him. Yo, what is wrong with you, dude? You know the Prophet's not going to say no to you. Why would you ask him? And he said, listen, listen, listen. He said, I'm not doing this because I'm selfish or anything like that. I'm not doing it for my own benefit. The only reason is because the day I die, I want to be buried wearing the clothes of the Prophet That's a legacy right there. That's a legacy right there. How many people here name Muhammad? Raise your hands. How many people? One, two, three, four. How many people name Ahmed around here? Anyone? There you go. Another four right there. How many name Murtaza? Murtaza is right there. Murtaza. Mushtaba. Murtaza. Yeah, we got one. Murtaza. Anyone? Mushtaba. Right? Hadi. All these are the names of the Prophet the most common name in the world. That's something that money cannot buy. Money cannot buy. All these people look around, the wealthiest people in the world, the richest people in the world, the top of the Forbes list. Are those people you look up to? Are those people you respect? Are those people that you admire, you adore? Oh, I want to be just like him when I grow up. These are people that you make memes out of, man. You make jokes out of these people. How many of those people are divorced? How many of those people, their kids run away from them? They don't even want anything to do with them. Money cannot buy you love, cannot buy you respect, cannot buy you admiration and adoration, cannot buy you honor and loyalty. Do you know what can though? The exact opposite of gaining money is giving it away. When you spend on people, you take care of people, you see how people will respect you, love you, admire you, adore you. People will surround you because of your generosity. The Prophet ﷺ was surrounded by people who knew that he would be there to help them no matter what. That's what makes a man. Someone that everyone can rely on. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most generous of people. Then he continues, وَكَانَ أَشْجَعَ nas. He was the bravest of people. And this is what everyone thinks manliness is, right? Bravery, courage. Let me tell you right now. Manliness is not sitting around in a room, making a four-hour podcast, talking to a bunch of men with your shirt off, smoking a cigar, wearing shades inside. I know you know who I'm talking about, right? And there's plenty of those people like that today. That's, that's what makes you a man. Imagine I'm sitting here with my shirt off, right? You're going to look at me like, what's wrong with this guy, right? And yet these are people that, you know, people look up to supposedly. Yeah, this is what makes a man. Right? Sitting around talking about 
all kinds of nonsense. Who has time to sit around and talk for four hours? For God's sake, you don't have a job, man? Like, you know, unemployed energy right there, my friend. Go and do something with your life. And yet, the Prophet ﷺ, this is how he ﷺ was the bravest of people. Let me show you how he was the bravest. The hadith continues. He says, وَلَقَدْ فَزِيَ أَهْلُ الْمَدِينَةِ لَيْلَةً A night came when the people of Medina, they heard a sound. Like, you know, today we have like sonic booms and stuff like that. Something like that. All of a sudden, they hear this explosive sound. At that time, they didn't have the kind of technology you and I do today. So it makes sense why. Today, you might hear like this loud sound. You might be like, oh, it's whatever, fireworks, something like that. Or there is like a jet that flew overhead or something like that. They didn't have anything like that back in the day. So this huge sound, people wake up terrified. Oh, what is that? And then people immediately get up out of their beds, start putting their clothes on, putting their shoes on, getting ready. And they run out of their homes and they all gather in the streets. Yo, you guys hear that? Yeah, I heard that too. Yeah, I think it came from this way. So they all gather together and they run in the direction of that sound. As they're running in that direction, the Prophet ﷺ, I want you to imagine this in your mind's eye, this, this sight. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, is coming back from the direction of the sound. They're going towards it, he's already on his way back. And he is sitting on a horse, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His horse, the horse belonged to Abu Talha radiallahu anhu. He's sitting on the back of that horse. There's no saddle on that horse. He has a sword in his hand hanging around his neck. You know you have the loop? He has a loop around his neck holding the sword in his hand. Imagine, like on top of a horse like this, holding a sword. Middle of the night. And he's telling the people that, لا تراؤوا, don't be afraid, nothing to be afraid of. يردهم, telling them, go home, go home, it's nothing to be afraid of. He had already gone and investigated what happened. And then he says about the horse, inna wajidnahu bahran, o innahu da bahrun. This is an ocean. Okay, let me explain this hadith to you. What does this mean? First and foremost, everyone in Medina, they heard that sound. By the time they put their clothes on, they get out of their house and they're walking on the streets, the Prophet is already coming back. Which means that these people were asleep. What was he doing, sallallahu alayhi wa He was wide awake. Everyone else is asleep. He is awake, sallallahu alayhi wa doing what? Praying to hajjud. Because the inner strength of a man, that is what exudes ex externally. You will see the strength of a person on the outside when they're inside. Their core is strong. We're not talking about your abs. We're talking about your heart. Right? Though you definitely should be do ab day as well. You know, ab day, leg day, you should definitely do that, right? So the Prophet ﷺ was internally strong. That strength came from his connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Because a person who has God on their side, it doesn't matter who's against them does not matter who's against them. In the middle of the night, he is up and praying. Everyone else is sleeping, snoring in their bed. He heard that sound. Everyone else heard that sound. They wake up. By the time they wake up, the Prophet ﷺ already has a sword. He's already picked up his sword from his, from his room. He's got the sword, opens the door, walks out. The first horse that he sees, he grabs that horse. Now, this is what makes a man that you're not looking around. Oh, who can, who can go and help? He doesn't say, where's Abu Bakr, where's Umar, where's Uthman, where's Ali, where's all these guys at? Can someone go and take care of this, please? He's not calling someone desperately, can you take care of this? He doesn't need to delegate the work. He's like, no, no, I'm the leader. I'm going to show you how to lead. He وسلم, grabs the sword, throws open the door. The first horse that he sees, he grabs it. Do you know how you know this is the first horse? This horse belonged to Abu Talha radiallahu anhu. This horse had a, a very bad reputation, unfortunately, in Medina. As one of the slowest horses in the whole city. It's a lazy old horse. People are like, yo, this is not going to go anywhere. And the Prophet ﷺ is not looking around. Let me find the strongest, fastest, quickest horse. He says, no, time is of the essence. You got to make moves. He sees the first horse, grabs it, and he jumps on top of it. Now, two things. Number one, that there was no saddle on this horse. Okay? We just went horseback riding a little while ago. Man, they spent like 15, 20 minutes explaining to us how to saddle the horse. Then they gave us little steps to, like, you know, you have steps over here. They told us, here's the steps. You got to stand on it. And then you have to slowly, gently put your leg here. And then your, your leg over it. And we have to wear a helmet and everything like that. We are like grown men. And they're making us do this, right? Looking like little children wearing helmets, riding this horse very gently. The Prophet ﷺ, do you know how old he was at this time? He migrated from Mecca to Medina when he was 53. He passed away when he was 63. So that means that he was وسلم, in his late 50s, early 60s, and he just goes to that horse, jumps right on top of it. No saddle, nothing, with a sword in his hand. We talk about, oh, that's an old man. Is that something an old man can do today? We look around at, you know, uncles today in, in our time and age, right? 50 years old, bro, they got a stomach that comes all the way out here. Right? The stomach will win the race before they do, you know? And yet the Prophet وسلم, that's not how the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa Absolutely. You know, his chest and his stomach was completely flat, as in like it was even, level. Right? And he saw something himself. Those swords are not light. A sword like that weighs 20, 30, 40 pounds. Think of, think of that for a second. Jumping on a weight, jumping on a horse, carrying that kind of weight with one hand. At that age, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gets on top of the horse and he sets off in the direction of the sound. He gets there, investigates, finds out everything, and he's on his way back. By the time people even put on their shoes, he's already on his way back. 
That's what it means to lead by example. That is bravery. That is courage. He's not saying, oh, where's my entourage? Where's my crew? Where's all my bodyguards? Nothing like that. He saw him as the first on the scene. What do I need to do to, do to protect my people? Look out for them, the people of Medina. And then he makes a statement. By the way, you know where we came across this hadith? We read this hadith in our last year of studies when we cover all the books of hadith. Well, we actually read this even earlier than that. In our fourth year when we study Baraha. Baraha is Arabic eloquence. Eloquence is basically, like, you know, deep statements, and you're like, man, that was a really powerful statement. Run that back one more time, you know? And so the Prophet ﷺ said this. It seems very simple and straightforward. We found him, the horse, to be an ocean. Two things. Number one, what does that mean? Found him to be an ocean. You know, if you go to, like, let's say you go to, you know, the coast. You're standing on the coast, and then you just look as far as the eye can see. As far as the eye can see. And you're basically watching, like, the end of the horizon, the end of the earth at that point, And your foot is right here on the shore. Now, imagine you take that other foot of yours, and you're able to extend it all the way to the edge of the ocean. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the strides this horse takes is as if it's crossing the ocean in one step. Hold on, what do we say at the beginning about this horse? It was slow. It was old and it was slow. But the Prophet said, no, we found it to be extremely quick and fast. Extremely quick and fast. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, first of all, this is a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. Second of all, if a person uses the resources, the abilities, the skills Allah has given you, and people, all of you have different skills and talents. Some things you're good at that he's not good at, that he is good at, that he's not good at. There are things like that. Things I'm good at and things that you're good at. And it's not all going to be the same. But if you use what Allah has given you for the right reasons, with the right intentions, Allah will bless you in that thing. Whatever it might be. And so the Prophet ﷺ used this horse, this old slow horse, for the right reasons, with the right intention, and you see how Allah made it into the quickest, strongest, fastest horse. Number one. Number two, he said that we found it to be an ocean. This is a, it's a, it's something called, a, in, uh, it's a rhetorical device called isti'ara. I'm not going to get into the whole grammar behind it, but basically the Prophet ﷺ would sometimes use words, phrases, rhetorical devices that were so powerful that even his own people didn't understand. Like if I use like a, you know, a couple of words right now, and you're like, man, what does that mean? Someone bust out the dictionary to figure that out, right? The Prophet ﷺ sometimes would use words, he would be having a gathering, just like you and I, and he would say something, he would have a long speech, and then he would use one or two words, and the people around him, they have to raise their hands. O Messenger of Allah, we understood everything you said except that one word. His people were known for their strength of the Arabic language, they were known for being extremely intelligent. But the Prophet ﷺ was even more intelligent than all of them combined. All of them combined. But his intelligence, his generosity, his strength, all of these things, وسلم, was never intimidating. It was never intimidating. That he was strong, he was physically capable, he was extremely intelligent, he was all of these things, وسلم, but it was never intimidating, like, oh no, I can't go near him. It was always inviting. Always inviting. So you should be all of the qualities of the Prophet وسلم, but never to the extent that people don't want to be around you. Rather, the Prophet وسلم, was magnetic. He was magnetic. Because they're like, this is somebody who can lead us, who can guide us, who can always be there for us. In every case, the Prophet ﷺ was there. If somebody needed food, that's the man to go to. People needed money, that's the man to go to. You need clothes, that's the man to go to. You need a commander for your army, that's the man to go to. You need a lady who's having issues with her husband, that's the man to go to. A man's having trouble with his children, that's the man to go to. The Prophet ﷺ was there for everyone in every single case. That is what makes a man that people can rely on, people can... Expect that that person will support them no matter what they are going through. And so that is why we have started this initiative. This is the first, inshallah, of many. And then we're going to try and learn skills. Each and every one of us will try to learn skills that will make you the best version of yourself. Understand, you're not competing with each other. That's not it at all. You're not competing with one another. Who are you competing with? Yourself. The man in the mirror. That's it. How can I be the best version of myself? You know, there's a saying, and you guys are all, almost all of you are under the age of 20, that a man who looks at the world the same way at 40 as he did at 20 has wasted 20 years of his life. If you look at life the same way at 40 as you are doing right now at 19 and 20, then you have wasted 20 years of your life. Every single day, we want to improve. Every single day, we want to get better. So inshallah, with this initiative, we will continue to learn those kind of skills and those kind of abilities that will enhance us to become better people, to become better Muslims, so that we can embody the ethos of the Prophet wasallam, so that we can be like the greatest human being that ever lived, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is everyone ready for this, inshallah? Yeah, you guys are ready? Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, we'll continue with the program. Um, Dr. Asad, inshallah, will tell us what's next. Or... So we're going to start with, um, we're going to start with parallel programs, right? So there's going to be two workshops going on, and we're going to divide you guys according to your 
uh, you guys have wristbands on, right? So we're going to divide according to that, and they're going to tell you in just a moment how we are going to divide them, inshallah. So what we're going to what we're going to do now is we have two workshops. There's a car workshop, and then there's a martial arts workshop. So if you have a green wristband, stay right where you are. If you have an orange wristband, then uh, stand up, and we're going to walk out that door uh, to go to the to the cars outside, and then and then we'll switch. So everyone's going to get to do both. All right, peace. So uh, my name is Adisa. Ben Joko, I teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at Half Gracie Santa Clara and at the LinkedIn headquarters. I've been doing it almost half my life. I'm 54. I started when I was like 27. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview about Jiu Jitsu. You know, I'm a black belt. I've been training for a long time. Uh, happy to be doing it. Um, grappling is a, it's an old sport, right? This is uh, not far from the pyramids, right? Wall of Beni Hassan, right? 2400 BC, grappling. If you look at these moves, you'll see a lot of stuff that you find in Greco-Roman. You'll find a lot of the same stuff that you'll find uh, in Jiu-Jitsu, right, is here. You know, grappling is a human language that, that men speak. And so it's important that you learn to speak this language. Lucky for all of you, even though you can't appreciate it right now and it's okay, like, this is the best time ever to learn martial arts that's ever existed. Not just because of the spectrum of the arts, but your access to them has never been higher. So there's no excuse for anyone in this room to not know how to defend themselves. If you don't know how to defend yourself, that is a choice that you made, and whatever happens, happens, right? And this doesn't have to be like a, oh, I'm getting ready to train for war and da da da. No, just know how to defend yourself as a human being. Know how to protect the elderly. Know how to protect uh, a youngster from a bully. Relax. All right, so cliff notes of my life. I started Half Gracie in Mountain View 1997. Um, I did it because uh, I just got married and my now ex-wife didn't want a gun in the house. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I, guess I got to be the gun. So, you know, jujitsu was new. Uh, I started going there. And the first day that I went there, just because, you know, I wasn't a very physical human. So um, I didn't really know what to expect. Anyway, I came out of there real sore. It wasn't that they were beating me down or anything, it's just I wasn't physical, you know, so I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. And I remember I was so sore, I would wake up in my sleep from moving. And I remember looking at the ceiling being like, man, this might not be the hobby for you, homie. You're in a lot of pain right now. And I was like, maybe it's time to call it, you know? Hey, salam, brother. And I said, you know what, go back. Just go back, and if it hurts this much again, don't do it. But if it hurts a little less, you stay. And now we're here, right? Um, I got my black belt from Alan Gumby Marcus, a hero's martial arts. He's one of uh, Hal's top students, and we started together. I've also recently done a movie called Rhythm of the Dragon that's at the Chinese Historical Society in uh, San Francisco. If you don't know who Bruce Lee is, most of the people you know that do martial arts do it in part because of Bruce Lee's huge influence. Don't sleep on Bruce Lee. Um, I just got back. Uh, I've been spending the last two or three years uh, going back and forth to the UK. So I've been touring across the United Kingdom, uh, doing jujitsu seminars, meeting with different people, and it's been profound. But before that, I was just a nerd. Look at this nerd, right? That was it, right? This is how we all start, just trying to figure it out. Getting socked up in the hallway, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you don't really know how to defend yourself. I didn't have a big family, so it wasn't like I had cousins or brothers that could look out for me. And uh, I didn't have any self-defense training. So the, the main thing I want you to know is like, I'm not made out of magic. Anything you see me do, I practice doing, period. And if you think of anything that you're not doing well in your life, weigh it against how much you're practicing that thing. And you'll find out that all you need is more practice. Um, Habib and Islam, they changed the game, right? We all love the UFC. We like fighting, but these dudes changed the game. Not just because of their technical prowess. They changed it because of their character. They changed it because of who, who they fought for, whose honor they sought. They weren't looking for Reebok sponsorships. They weren't looking to do anything but glorify the God they love and the prophet they love and the path that they walk in the cage. Um, this is huge, right? And what is it? This is just a reminder, right? The explosion of, of Islam in the grappling arts and in the martial arts world is just a reminder 
that we've been doing this. I know a lot of you guys probably heard about Joe Rogan and Huberman Lab, and you see him talking about fasting and the importance of that. Been doing that. Talk about deliberately enduring hardship. Like I, I study Stoic philosophy, right? And they have this thing called voluntary hardship. Muslims do voluntary hardship every Ramadan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, 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 we deprive ourselves to pay more attention, to, to increase our gratitude. So all these things now that the West, I just saw a thing for, a, for a, 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 an alcohol-free bar. That's the new thing. I was like, for real? Sounds like Islam. <laughs> we, we've been doing that. <laughs> Y'all just hanging out, having drinks with no alcohol in it. Innovative. Um, and so, but this is what happens in an America that's out of touch uh, with itself and having a hard time to acknowledge culturally what others have already been doing, right? It's only important when they do it. So fasting's important now because they understand the benefits. Staying away from alcohol is important now because they understand the benefits. We always knew. Right? So why do you learn jujitsu? You learn because you need to take time to learn how to defend yourself or you will lose to those who train. It's a very simple equation. All right, so yes, prophetic grappling. You need this book, Nisar Sheikh. Get this book. Like, I'm telling you to pull your phones out now and get it or take a picture of this screen and tell your parents to get it for you as soon as possible, right? This book is amazing because it breaks down the life of the prophet peace be upon him as a grappler but you also learn the larger role that masjids used to play they weren't just places of prayer they were places for training they were places for uh business they were places for cultural interaction right and i think that you know i'm so honored to be here today because so many masjids are afraid to do exactly what's happening here i'm so grateful because I can't tell you how many ghost town masjids I've been walking through for the last half of my life. And it's like, all we have to do is embrace the prophetic sports to help the young people want to be around the elders and one another, and everything will start to take care of itself. But as long as we push things away and, and, and we don't take time to really step into the sunnah of grappling, we're going to have little different problems in our community. Right, so this is me and Grandmaster Helio Gracie and his son Horian Gracie. The guy you see uh, on the other side of Helio, he created the Ultimate Fighting Championship. He's the reason uh, Habib and Islam even had a place to express themselves, right? And so uh, they came from Brazil, they brought this art through the UFC, and it exploded and reignited the grappling, uh, the grappling craze that's happening now. That's me and Hoist Gracie sparring about 30 seconds before he triangle choked me really hard. Um, <laughs> it's hilarious. But I was like, oh, I, I passed Hoist Gracie's guard. I, I, must be, I must be a factor. I was not a factor. Um, I got took out a few seconds after that flash went off. And, um, you know, but it was fun and it was amazing. And, and Hoist Gracie, for those that don't know, he's the first champion of the UFC. And he took Shahada about two weeks ago. All right? So I want you to think about that. The pioneer of MMA in North America now has the same Islam, has the same uh, faith as one of the greatest fighters to ever be in it, right? Talking about Habib and Islam, it's, it's an unbelievable circle, right? And so people have been calling me, they go like, why do you think, why do you think Hoist came to Islam? Why do you think Hoist came to Islam? The truth is, I don't know, but I can tell you that just doing what the prophet did probably made it easier for her to, un for easier for him to understand Islam right? As he came to it, right? And the wisdom that comes from grappling is, 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 is something that it's very quiet. It's a quiet wisdom, right? When you see real jujitsu champs, they're very quiet. They're not talkative. They're not chatty. They're not, they're rarely braggadocious in the way that they carry themselves. And that's because a lot of the, the blessings that you get of gratitude and courage and wisdom intemperance it comes quietly so this was a talk uh that i did in uh in liverpool it's unbelievable um you know how the muslims overseas in the uk have taken on uh grappling you know what i'm saying they're very serious about it and um i want to talk to you about this idea of being anti-fragile if you leave with anything i say today leave with this leave with this right 
What does it mean to be anti-fragile? It comes from this guy named Nassim Taleb, who's like an economist and whatnot. But listen to this idea. So on one side, in most of the world, you have things that are fragile, like this box. You know, it withers in the sun and the water, it falls, and it will always be fragile. And then you have this brick, right? No matter what happens to that brick, if it gets ran over, if it rains on it, it's always going to be a brick, okay? And it's going to stay in its name. But the human being is anti-fragile. So what this means is, um, Abdurrahman, if I, if I ask you to carry a 50 kettlebell for the rest of the day, right, how would your arm feel at the end of the day? The end of today, one day of carrying 50 pounds everywhere you go. Fairly sore, you know what I'm saying? Fairly sore, right? But how would that same arm feel if you did it? For three months, how would your arm be after three months? Probably be fine. It would be fine, right? Why? Because your body is anti-fragile. The muscles, the tendons, everything would adapt to that 50 pounds. So what hurts on the first day, you don't even feel it three, four months later, right? Because your body adapts. Your body is anti-fragile. The mind is anti-fragile. And that's how you can take someone like Malcolm X, who was actually a dope dealer, actually a gangster, actually robbing people, actually going into people's homes and taking stuff. He goes to jail, you lock him up with books, he comes out debating people at Oxford and winning. He comes out a leader. He comes out changing his entire community, changing the world. And I, I don't even know if I'd be here if it wasn't for Malcolm X and what his autobiography did for my understanding of the world. Okay? Your mind is anti-fragile. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is don't run away from stress and pressure because that's how you grow. And learning jujitsu, learning wrestling, exposing yourself to that adversity and that toughness is how you move forward. Okay? Um, you were born to adapt. Look at this right here. Talking about these proteins in the brain that uh, doing sports like jujitsu help grow. Mind plasticity. Everybody's talking about neuroplasticity, right? And here you see that jujitsu and wrestling will give you neuroplasticity, right? The wisdom of Rumi, you're a precious hidden diamond sunken in mud. We all are, right? The ignorance of this world, the darkness of this world, right? And we have to find light within and we have to find our connection through Allah, to Allah on our own time. Right? And then you get champs like Terere. You got to fight for that. That stuff is hard. It is not easy, but it is always worth it. And I'm not even talking about gold medals. I'm not even talking about championships. I'm not even talking about competing. I'm talking about just finding out who you are through physical activity. Right? And now let's talk about the, the value of reviving a forgotten sunnah. So many of us have left grappling. So many of us have walked away from all of the Futua sports. You talk to these youngsters about archery, they don't know nothing. You talk to them, right? But the older, a lot of the older men don't either, right? So if we're going to like be critical of the youth, we have to think about of the leadership and what examples were we giving these young men and these young women today, right? Um, Seneca, the Stoic philosophy, said a gem cannot be polished without friction nor a man perfected without trials. This is, this is in Liverpool. This is Mario Sukata, the guy in the middle uh, from the Carlson Gracie team. He runs everything down there. And what was hilarious is I was so excited because I had done the, the, the first classes at Zaytuna with chess and jiu-jitsu. I couldn't wait to get to the UK and share with them this idea of what we should be doing with grappling. And everything they had was better than everything we have. Everything they had was better than everything we have. Facilities bigger, students bustling, all ages. What? Then I went to another region. Okay, maybe it'll be different. Better again. What? At Mustafa Mount. Then, I, okay, maybe I'll go to this other spot. Better again. We're behind. We're late. They're doing it. And there's no excuse that the parents and the uncles and the aunties who got money all in this valley? Are you kidding me? No excuse. No excuse. Right? I'm happy that they're doing better than us so I can learn. But there's no excuse. We should be ahead. Right? This is the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, ADCC. Look at it. European and Middle East and African Championship. How many people knew this was happening? 
None of y'all. That's my point. I knew the answer before I asked it. And so the thing is, is that I'm trying to get you to figure out how is all this going on in the world and you don't know. If you don't feel some kind of weirdness about that, that's a problem. You should want to be in line with the other young people in your Ummah. You should know about Sheikh Tanun and how he's been doing this since you competed in Abu Dhabi, didn't you? Didn't you compete once? Uh, yeah. yeah. What year was that? 96. Right? And people often, they ask me, oh, should women do jiu-jitsu? What do you think about women in jiu-jitsu? Yeah, the answer is yes. For two main reasons. One, and the main one is, come on, let's be honest. All the ox ain't ox up in here. Let's be honest. All the uncles ain't uncling. All right? And when they not, somebody needs to regulate. And everybody wants to, you gonna regulate? You, you gonna regulate? Nah, you gonna regulate because you've been training. We got to have higher standards for the men in this community when we see abusers. Emotional, spiritual, physical. We're not having it. And we need to know, the sisters need to know that when you, you need to know when you're not around her, she knows how to handle herself, period. All right? You see the sisters at Zaytuna right there doing the chess and jiu-jitsu program, right? And even though a lot of people don't talk about it, the coldest person who had a double leg at Zaytuna was a woman. The coldest person with a double leg was a woman. All right? So don't act like they can't fight or shouldn't fight or shouldn't know how to defend themselves. They absolutely need to know how to defend themselves. Don't be illusory about that. And what's it say in the Quran that the men are the guardians of women? But most of the men don't even know how to defend themselves. How, who are you going to guard? You can't jog two blocks. You going to guard something? I can't hear that. Al-Ghazali, right? Look at this quote. Declare your jihad on 13 enemies you cannot see. Egoism, arrogance, conceit, selfishness, greed, lust, intolerance, anger, lying, cheating, gossiping, and slandering. If you can master and destroy. Notice, he didn't just say master. He said master and destroy them. Then you'll be able to fight the enemy you can't see. Jiu-Jitsu ultimately is about knowledge of self. Jiu-Jitsu ultimately is about knowledge of self in your relationship with yourself and your understanding of the beautiful words of the prophet, peace be upon him. All right? So now I'll put this mic down and we're gonna work on some jujitsu. A few quick things. One, if someone taps out or says the word tap, let go. Let go. It doesn't matter if you get, oh, I, don't, I wasn't really doing it that hard. Let go. We are training, this isn't a fight club. Let's relax. Um, so what I'm asking people to do is try rolling with Rumi on the mat and in your mind. Let jujitsu not just be uh, a physical exercise. Let it be a spiritual exercise, right? And then step into your Islam and see how you can elevate your understanding of Allah and the Prophet, peace be upon him, through your training sessions, through the friendships you have, okay? Uh, follow your boy on IG and TikTok. You know that drill. There's the website. I'm um, also, there's a thing called the Everyday Stoic. It just dropped on YouTube. Check me out there, right? And then Abdullah Dutton, the new Nomos podcast. All y'all should be watching that anyway. Um, and I'm super grateful to everybody at the Walnut Creek Islamic Center, San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, MCC East Bay here. All right, and thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate you. Um, these are so many of the people who've made jujitsu uh, in the Bay Area and around the world for me possible. So I want to thank all of them. And now let's uh, put this mic down and we'll get this popping today. Okay. Thank you for listening and I hope this helps. Peace. A huge part, first of all, I want to thank you for coming, trusting yourself. Trust in MCC, coming out and being vulnerable to learn this. You don't, look, I know only some of you will choose to stay with this. That's okay, right? That's okay. What you needed to do was get a sense of what you are capable of doing. Everything I'm showing you, and I mean everything that I'm showing you, one, I did not know at all, and two, I was horrible at for many years. So a big part of jujitsu is learning to be patient. When we talk about, 
you know, when you read in the Quran and Hadith about the value of patience, about the value of courage, wisdom, right, balance, temperance, right, justice, right, you learn who you are in all of those spaces when you roll. You learn who you are in those spaces when you roll. Sometimes you're going to be tired. Sometimes you're going to be scared. Sometimes you're going to be angry. Sometimes that anger is going to go too much. Sometimes fear will make you hesitate. And you can take these things into other parts of your life, in business, in school, in your personal relationships, and you can have a whole different level of clarity. A whole different level of clarity. Right? So I hope that you stay with grappling. And when I say that I hope that you stay with grappling, I don't mean that I hope you go on to fight in Abu Dhabi or be the next Habib or any of that. I just mean that you stay with it so that you know yourself, you have a sense of knowing the Prophet, peace be upon him, a little bit better, and you have a sense of knowing your potential. Because we live in a time where because of the phones and so many other things that's going on in, in society that we really look, we always feel like everybody else is doing better. They have something we don't have. They're going somewhere we're not able to go, et cetera, et cetera. But through jujitsu and through the sunnah, you can find the peace that you actually need. Right? But you can't do it alone. You need other people to practice with. You need other people to give you pressure. You need other people to have ideas you don't have. And that's how we grow. So I want to thank you for trusting yourself. Thank you for trusting me, for sharing this time, sharing this space. It doesn't feel like a historic day. This is a very historic day. You are a part of a very historic day. And again, somebody in this crowd or maybe someone in your family because you'll tell them about what you did today will go on to be great because of what you chose to do today and for that i'm very grateful so i'm like um all right so so right i'm showing you escapes why because like i could show you some old crazy arm locks and choke holes slam stuff but one we don't have any mats right so that's no good so slams are out right um the other thing is like i could show you an armbar escape but you don't know an armbar right and so most people won't try to armbar you but they will try to get the mount and give you a few to the jaw right so now you already got that escape and the other thing they're going to do is i'll probably put you in a headlock and try to give you a few to the jaw so I'm dealing with positions that are grappling positions, but also striking, you know what I'm saying? They favor striking, right? So before I show the headlock escape, I'm gonna show you the headlock. Please pay attention to it. Because if you don't do the headlock right, the escape nature, you know what I'm saying? It changes. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit next to Ali so that my hip is next to his hip. Hip next to the hip, cool. Now, my right arm is gonna go under his head. My left hand is, look, I'm gonna keep his wrist kinda of in my armpit and I'm gonna have this C cupping hand here. My knee is gonna be under his shoulder and I'm grabbing my leg. Now, on the street, I wouldn't be like this because I'm talking to you, right? But he could punch me straight in the face, right? Boop, and then it's like, world star, and it's all bad. So, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna put my temple on the outside of his temple and now, he's just going to make me mad with that. He ain't going to win. All right? He's just going to make me mad. Now, if I wanted to finish the fight, don't do this move. If I want to finish the fight, I can just trace up his hand. You see how his arm is here? I stick my leg out. Watch this. All right? One more time, one more time. I'm just showing you how fights can end, guys. I'm not really... Right, just my ankle on his wrist. Ooh, what if I stomp on that thing? Ooh, yeah. on right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is this is why this is why there's mercy in grappling, right? Because what happens to him becomes my choice now. This not this may not be a fight. This might be the drunk uncle. You've all got one, right? This may be the uncle who's tripping. Be like, hey, uncle, gotta come on, bro. Relax, man. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to get some trauma. You know what I'm saying? You tripping out, right? So you may just want to contain somebody. It may not be, you know what I'm saying? We have this idea, it's going to the death in the alleyway. It just could be containing a person who's not well, right? Someone that you care about or a stranger. So hip to hip, under the head, C-clamp, right? I'm grabbing my own hamstrings behind me, okay? So now let's look at how do we get out of that. And remember, remember, real quick, real quick, but I, the main problem here, right, in a street fight is 
How many people know this? Almost nobody. They do know this, though. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just want to win, bro. That's it. Right? So this is my problem. I've got a guy who's pinned me on my back with the potential to punch me in the face repeatedly. And i got to get out of here. So let's look at that. <laughs> so as discussed again, right, there's a logic leverage and timing here. This is not cool. The main problem is I'm stuck on my back. I have this concept they call facing your fears. I realized early in being here that if I want to get out, I can't turn away. If he squeezes and I try to turn away from the side he's on, I start sounding like SpongeBob on the beach. Right? This is not cool. Right? In order for me to get out, I gotta face this way. But he's pinning me. Right? My hips are on the mat, my back's to the floor. Okay, so I gotta turn my legs this way. It's called a rainbow move. It comes from judo. You come here, right? Like capital L, and I'm gonna bring both of my legs this way like a rainbow, okay? And I'm gonna face him, but I gotta yank this arm to me so it hits the mat, right? I need to get my arm back, okay? So I, I run my legs this way. I start to yank my arm when my legs get here. Now I have my arm back, cool, right? But he could still bomb if he felt like it until I come here, because now I'm on my side, okay? At this point, dudes are so happy that they have a headlock that they super squeeze, because like, but I still got him, you know what I'm saying? So from here, I get back to my toes, and I'm gonna bridge this way and turn to my forehead. Get to my knees, now watch, I pull my arm out, I get behind here. Right? Let's look at that again. Right? I'm stuck on my back. Right? He's got it right. I need to get on my side. I need to face my fears. Whatever side he is on, that's how I gotta go. That's it. I can't run away. Oh, I'm SpongeBob. It's no good. I'm here. Rainbow, yank the arm. Right? Use this hand a little bit to help you stop the punches. They commit to this squeeze. Now you can put your feet this way and be on your back safely because you're halfway out already, okay? I'm going to bridge up forward and turn to my forehead. Boom. Come out back. I use here. Just put my hand on the shoulder. Fall back, right? And it starts getting nasty, right? Okay, let's play this slow, right? Let yourself be in each section so you're not just kind of trying to burst out, right? You need to know that you understand the mechanics of the escape. Does anybody have a question about this escape before we start? Okay, same partners. One, two, three. How's everybody? How was the first workshop? Who did the cars? All right, tell me one thing you learned. Say your name. Uh, Niall. Uh, there are seven kinds of fluids that go into a car. Seven types of food? There's seven kinds of fluid. Fluid. Oh, okay. Can you name all seven? Yeah. Go. Brake fluid, gasoline, uh, windshield wiper fluid, engine oil, hydraulic uh, fluid. How many was that? I don't know. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right, but what if you have a Tesla? Uh, what, what, what types of fluid go into Tesla? Uh, is... Just a water fluid, right? Which your wiper? Yeah. All right, if you're on the wall, come out. All right. We already have our next event. Whoever made the flyer, I'm not going to call them out. It doesn't have the date. date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Mar <laughs> March, uh, March 23rd. All right. Yeah, so the next event is Saturday, March 23rd at service. We're going to email out. It'll be a qiyam from 11.30 p.m. to 4 a.m. We have Imam Jihad Safir from LA, as well as our local Imams, Imam Bilal and Imam Hassan. So next event, and then our goal is to do a monthly event at either one of the three masjids or off-site, and it'll be really chill. You meet at Doha time, have a short khatara from Imam Bilal, Imam Hassan, and then an event, like a, like a practical workshop. So we want ideas. So we're going to send a survey out. If it's your parents' email, that's fine. Just tell them, hey, this is what I'm interested in. If you want to do something more specific on cars, we could do that. If you want to do something else, we could do that. 
Um, like Zuhair knows how to fix bikes. Maybe you could do a bike workshop. All right? So anything. Um, like how to cook. How many people want to know how to cook basic foods? All right? So like we'll do how to cook for men. Like everyone should know how to make a basic egg, a basic omelet. Everyone should know how to make certain things, right? So think about the things you wanted to learn. Okay, I know you guys are excited, but think about the things you want to learn. We have Zishan is going to talk about what you should know from an economic standpoint. Like once you can start investing, how should you invest? Should you open a crypto account? Should you open like, you know, at what point should you start saving for retirement? At what point can you save for retirement? Like just smart investing. When can you do stocks? How old do you have to be to open an account to trade stocks? 18? Okay. But having your parents open an account for you and put a little bit. Right? If you have some money you make, like you know when you finish the Quran, people give you all this money, right? What are you doing with that money? Is it just sitting in a checking account? Or are you going to ask your parents how do you invest it, right? So we're going to try to have practical skills that will benefit you, inshallah. Also, how to get married. How to make yourself attractive for marriage, right? So we got some ballers in the house, like Zishan, and he could tell us, right, how he got married, how he stayed married, how he raised children, right? So we have a lot of uh, things we can learn practically, inshallah. You have like, I'm too young. You're only a few years away, right? And by the way, this is what's important about this, is your reputation now is what's going to get you married in the future. Okay? Did I, do you hear that? Because every auntie right there that has a daughter sees you now. It's like, I remember that kid. He was always making noise in the masjid. He was always causing trouble. That's one reputation. The other reputation is like, man, that... That, that, that person was always helpful. That person was always volunteering. That person was always neat and clean and smiling. Right? Which person do you want to be? The handsome one. The handsome one. It doesn't matter if you're handsome or not. I get, I'll tell you. There's some brothers. They were fives. Okay? But they had good akhlaq. They had good manners. And they married tens. Okay? Huh? I'm just saying. They were fives. Okay? Some of you guys are fives and you want to marry tens. It's not going to happen unless there's tawfiq from Allah. Okay? Five, I said some of you guys are fives. Okay? By the way, we shouldn't rate each other. But, you know, alhamdulillah. All right. We're going to have Imam Hassan, inshallah, from San Ramon. Inshallah, give a talk. Who knows what month is coming up? Shawwal. What month? April. No, not April. Ramadan, inshallah. So we're going to talk about preparing ourselves spiritually for Ramadan with our beloved Imam of service, Imam Hassan. And by the way, he just had his third baby girl. Mashallah. Say mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen wa ala min tabi'ahu wa hada bihadihi ila yawm al-dini wa ba'd. Before we get into everything, how y'all doing? That was very lame, very quiet. How y'all doing? Are you guys having fun? Are you guys networking with one another? Right. So one of the main reasons of this event is also for you guys to network across different masajid. So if you find yourself sometimes sitting in the same clique, it is very important for you to go about and meet everyone around. At the end of today, you should have built that brotherhood where you meet each and every single person that you have seen in this gathering. That is your responsibility as a youngster in the town to get to know your fellow brothers. And you have no idea, I swear to you, you have no idea what happens 10 years from now. You're going to remember that one person in the event that was there that one time and you're meeting him after 10 years and he's such a cool person to hang out with and, and you know, to go to dinner with, for, for example, you know, just do random things with and you could have had all this time, you could have networked with this person, this person could have become something really, you know, um, uh, successful in whatever terms and ways you understand that. So it's important to maintain good character, good akhlaq with each and every single person around you and meet each and every single person. If you can, introduce them, in introduce yourself. You may not remember each other's names, but over a period of time, you will definitely build that bond. That bond is the most important. Do you know why without that bond, you would not be able to be a true man? How does that make sense? Without that bond of brotherhood, you will never be able to be a true man. How does that make sense? Iron sharpeth iron. Iron sharpeth iron. You can't sharpen yourself. 
you cannot sharpen yourself. You don't have physically the capability to sharpen yourself consistently throughout the time. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned you should, you should be in good company. And if there's no good company left, then essentially, you know, find your cave. Right? Essentially. But Alhamdulillah, we have many good brothers out here in the community that you can get to know and build a bond. And inshallah, um, especially coming up in Ramadan, it's a beautiful time to get to know one another and build spiritually um, and, you know, just togetherness, inshallah. So let's segue into Ramadan. One of the definitions of Ramadan, Ramadan. Can anyone help me here? Yes. Ramadan means to eat. Let's go, no? Oh, heat. I thought you said eat. Subhanallah. We're hungry, huh? Ramadan means, yes, it's almost like uh, kind of when you, like iron. Let's use iron, for example. How do you mold iron and how do you strengthen iron? You heat it. And the more heat you place and the more heat you are able to get on that piece of iron, the stronger you are able to hit it and the more stronger the blade will be. Or whatever that, or whatever you trying to engineer. In Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts each and every single one of us through, uh, through this heat, this pangs of hunger, this choosing to stay away from items that may be, that are permissible for us on a daily basis. But in Ramadan, you can't touch it. And if you touch it, if you eat in Ramadan, what happens, guys? If you eat intentionally, like, hey, nobody's watching me, mom's not watching, we'll get a cookie in my mouth real quick, what happens? Allah is watching you, but what happens after that? You got to fast 60 days straight. This ain't no joke. You got to fast 60 days straight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these things in place to, for us to go through and understand this. Now the beauty of Ramadan, the beauty of the time of Ramadan, it is a good moment to build habits. Scientifically speaking, you guys can do your research um, later. You need, you need about 30 to 40 days to build a habit within your body. We're all born upon this thing, this thing called fitra. You guys know what fitra is? Fitra is your natural state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you in. You don't need somebody to tell you you can't cheat. You don't need somebody to tell you you can't lie. You don't need somebody to tell you you can't hurt someone else. Unless you do what? And again, let's move on. You don't need somebody to tell you that there's more than one God. There isn't more than one God. There's only one God, right? And so what changes that? Our environment changes that fitra. Our thought processes change over a period of time, and then we develop habits. At this time and age in your life, between the age of 13 to, I would say, 15, 16, those habits can easily be eradicated from your life. Very easy. Extremely easy to get, get rid of those habits from your life. From the age of 18 to 20, it starts becoming a little more difficult, but it is possible. But I, I, I swear, after 20 years old, it becomes very difficult. It becomes very difficult for you to change your habits. So developing the right habits is extremely important. We always look up to people from the economic, economic atmosphere, people like you know, any of these multi-millionaires or billionaires, like, wow, how could I achieve this? Or even people who have worked really hard to achieve what they have, ask them. They all have? They all have what? They all have habits. And they stick to their, of course, they all, that's the reason why they find success. Now, stumbling upon success is, is a different thing. We're talking about people who have worked really hard, who have the right ideology, who do things in the right way, and who you admire truly as a human being. Who are the Muslim or not? We can get into, those, into that discussion later. But they have habits, and they try to stick to those habits. Waking up on time, sleeping on time, getting